cool. Well, I guess we got everybody here, so I appreciate you guys jumping on and doing this. Um, we can do introductions as we go, but, you know, as I talked to everybody beforehand, like, I want to make this as conversational as possible. Um, if anybody want, has a question or feels like they can add some value to the conversation or just whatever comes to mind, uh, please feel free. Let's make this free flowing as possible. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody coming on board. I think it's super necessary and an important time considering none of us have ever dealt with something like this before. And uh, I think all of us really are um, curious to start with the, the, the managers who had artists release music last week. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, Corey had his artist Murder Beats release music, Banana Split with, um, with Melly and Little Dirk. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a single. And then um, we also had Sasha, who Tori had a record or a song that they released last week. Tyler and, our, and myself and Byron, we had an album come out, a debut album for Jesse before Love Came to Kill Us. And Tyler had Party Mobile come out last week as well, too. So I, I naturally want to start the conversation with Tyler. Um, and what was the strategy considering, you know, we're limited with what we had in terms of resources. Um, and how, how did you pivot? How did you maneuver? Just curious as to what your release week looked like. <clears throat> yeah, so about two weeks before the album came out, we had to pivot pretty much all of our week of release plans. Uh, we had events that were gonna happen in each city uh, the week of. So we we're gonna do New York, uh, Toronto, LA, and then London. Uh, and those are going to be the four days leading up to the album where we had specific, we had these release events that was essentially a live experience of the album where fans would go in cars and they would be in this warehouse that was all uh, decorated towards the theme of the album. And so when, you know, all this was happening, we, we were luckily, uh, you know, we, we luckily made a lot of decisions before it was too late. And so it was just about figuring out how to then take that same concept and, and bring it online. And so we were lucky to find a partner with Twitch uh, for the actual release event. And so we built, and so instead of building the experience for fans in person, we decided to build it online. And so we did a, essentially a 35 minute short video that was animated for the, the listeners to hear the album for the first time. And you made that decision to go with Twitch as as everything like in real time as we were figuring it out because of the pandemic yeah we we're less than two weeks from the album dropping when we when we reached out to them to put that together and okay. so it, it, it what's that no go ahead yeah i was gonna say so it, it all happened really quickly and uh it was they were definitely a great partner you know they really supported us and what we wanted to put together and and we knew it wouldn't be the same experience as seeing it in person but for us, we just wanted to do something that was for the fans, uh, for that, you know, due to all the constraints. And, and what about um, during release week? What, what strategies did you guys implement um, and pivot there? Yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, going, doing as much digital and online as possible. And so we had an animated visualizer built for each song that when the week of uh, we got on, I, I believe Jesse's on as well, community. Yeah, where you yeah. can text fans directly. Yeah. So we, uh, we got party on a little over a week before the album dropped. Nice. And every day he started texting his fans uh, snippets to songs and clips of the trailers that we wouldn't put on social media, that we would just send the fans directly to build that sort of community and to make it feel like it was their process throughout it all. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so that was a big one was building that, you know, as many one-on-one -on -one connections as possible. And, he spent a lot of time talking to fans and talking to people through that uh, as we were releasing the content we had already built. And so, you know, it was just building as many things digitally as we could that still fit within the theme and brand of the album and a party. It's I, for us as well, too, community has been like a godsend. Like it's been, it's, it's been incredible. Yeah. Incredibly pivotal, pivotal to what our release strategy is, especially on digital. And when the shit hit the fan with us, I mean, we were supposed to be on tour with Billie Eilish and three shows in, I think, Byron, we yeah, all, it was March 10th, March 10th that it all, it all went away. Yeah, it all went away. <laughs> and yeah, basically just to a complete halt. Disappeared. Everybody had to go home. And so, but right away, I think we made a conscious effort to just uh, double down, even triple down on digital. And I don't, I don't think we'd be able to communicate 
um, as effectively without community and texting Jesse's fans, letting them know that there was merch coming out or, or deluxe coming out or music. And of course, you can put it on social media as well too, but when you're sending a text to somebody, sometimes yes, they're broadcast messages. Jesse's, it's a broadcast message, but it's always Jesse. But you know, she's also direct messaging the fans, but it's the, apparently it's like the open rate is like 98% within 60 seconds. So you're gonna read it. Right? It's great because they, they don't limit you yet, right? And so right. Uh, all these social media apps were built for you to build a following and fan base through, and then they want to then sell you to access more of your followers that you have. And so, uh, you know, what you could do through paid promotion, but the great thing about community is, yes, you get to reach everybody that you know is a dedicated Jesse or party fan uh, immediately without having any of those limitations that Instagram or Facebook may have. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just got uh, Murda signed up on Community also a couple of days ago. Amazing. The launch of the first oh, that's song. That's amazing. We haven't really done much promo for it. I was, I, when I first saw Jesse posting like tonight from 7 to 8, I'm going to be texting all my fans. I thought she was crazy putting her number up. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had, what's going on? <laughs> well, she, she put out that, that she was like high on the prescription pills because her back went up. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Like, that. I'm, all, I'm all high right now. And I just put my phone. And I had like people like call me like, dude. Jesse just put her cell phone number out there. I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. But it is good, though. I mean, because it is her communicating, and it is murder, and it is, like, party that I've been communicating with the fans. And exactly. People love that shit, man. It's like the engagement. So if you send a direct message, it's like uh, people lose it when that happens. Especially Yeah, when, and, and, and during this time, more than ever, you know, the more we can do yeah. and, and talk to our, our artists about how they can be more engaged and and – develop those one-on-one -on -one relationships you know i think uh it's it's really interesting to see and just wh however you want to curate that experience as an artist is up to you yeah. but uh it just shows how many tools there are out there for it i, I think right now more than ever too because nobody's nobody's traveling nobody's out on the road right now people are sitting at home and they can't like an artist can sit down in a community and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people throughout the day when you know on a regular record cycle, if you're out running around doing promo and popping up here and popping up there and jumping on a flight, like you're not, you're not necessarily able to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Sure. Sure. Corey, you yeah. mentioned that, that you guys just got on community, but you're from your experience as well too, managing a producer who has just as much clout as some artist, and if not more, um, and doing that successfully in a time where not a lot of producers are the super producers, but you've been able to do that. Um, and we've been releasing the song last week. What did you find uh, by putting out that song and, and what strategies did you implement? Well, uh, yeah, as, as, everyone, as you guys have mentioned, obviously things had to be adjusted a bit. Um, similar to Tyler, we had a full, Murder hasn't been to New York for a press week, uh, like to do a, press run in over a year so we were really excited we had a full week planned um in new york and then going back to canada the day the song came out he was about to donate money to his high school um there's a whole big thing set up and press for that and uh do, do some radio stuff in toronto also and um the corona stuff and quarantine and fear and all that really just started about a week like all of us me you and sasha tyler we all had releases it was on the, the same day and that was like that was kind of like the week that it was happening so we really had to adjust everything and um we switch fortunately with a uh, new pr that we just started with our, our our old pr still on board um the labels pr we were able to put together quite a bit of press still week of um a lot of a lot of ig takeovers which has been cool um community obviously has been a cool new way to connect to fans and um yeah there's i i feel like i feel like a lot of the press that we would have had in new york we got over phone or in interviews and facetime interviews and we actually got quite a bit of more press that we might have not uh received from that's interesting people like people like yeah. billboard saying take over our instagram i think murders let's take over yeah. Biden's instagram and um a lot of a lot of instagram live stuff and uh we actually murder had a really good idea um right when the quarant the quarantine started uh, all of our release dates were the, the tw 27th the first day when they canceled classes and stuff was a week before that and murder murder like 
came up with the idea him, himself. We made a deal. We, we uh, started something with Splice a few months ago, but he's like, that we were working on to release in a couple of months, but he's like, why don't I drop my first ever beat pack, quarantine pack for, uh, for all the producers out there working from home. And we released on uh, Wednesday, the 25th, Murder's first ever sample pack. It was a, a drum kit, to, to quarantine kit, and it, it broke every record. It was the best first two days, first day, first, first week of, that they've ever had on the platform. So. I feel like when I, was, when I was going online, I feel like you guys were the first to really pivot in the public eye, um, from my perspective, with a drop like that with Murder, for him saying, I want to drop this for quarantine, and or like a quarantine pack. So I thought that was brilliant, actually. And I was like, I was really interested to find out like how you guys did with that pack too. So that's pretty crazy, man. Yeah. And um, I just really lit a fire in every, every PR person working with us and label that we all got to go really hard. And um, yeah, every, I mean, everyone, everyone's, everyone's busy still, but everyone has tons of time now more than ever. So uh, we're all quarantined at this point. They've been pressing yeah. everybody, yeah. Shout out to Sasha for your artist being the being the Yo, superstar the owner, the the owner, bro. Yeah, yeah. The owner of Instagram right now. You guys we, got, we, we, we need a whole share segment share? just for that. <coughs> we need a whole segment think, just for that. I think that yeah. I'm probably the only person that's benefited probably from this whole thing. Um, <laughs> no, nah, I mean, listen. A star, obviously, a lot of people um, have been coming to me and talking to me about it. Like, listen, Tori and I have been in business nine years. We've done a lot of great things together. Quarantine Radio, I deserve zero credit. Um, this is all him. I think, you know, there are a lot of y'all um, on here that have spent time around Tori. Y'all know, like, that's really him. Like, this is, like, really, truly who he is. And I think that what has been exciting about watching it is get, you know, it's been my first time having other people see like, oh, I get it. Like, I really get it. Um, so I'm proud of him for doing him. But this is not some like brilliant, like marketing campaign. <laughs> Yo, my dog's out here. <laughs> I told him, I'm like, y'all are embarrassing the fuck out of me. <laughs> uh, but no, nah, I mean, Tori deserves a lot of credit for this. He really busted his ass. And I think that it speaks to authenticity. And, you know, I think all of us were, were trying to look to, to do things that are authentic and real and quarantine radio. This is just him being him. Um, and people love it. And so, yeah, uh, it's been fun. Well, it wasn't something that you guys were th was he was thinking of doing beforehand. This is just a kind of spur of the moment. Dude, no. And it just happens to be that, you know, we got an album dropping on Thursday, New Toronto 3. Uh, um, yeah. But, we, but uh, we got an album dropping on Thursday. And, you know, this is the last album with Interscope. So after this, he's a completely independent artist. So, um, you know, we had like all these marketing ideas. And obviously with the New Toronto coming out, I mean, we had Out of Home in play up to like three weeks ago. You know what I mean? So we wow. just had to change you know marketing you know plays in, in real time but he went and set the table so you know now we put out this project he's an independent artist no pub deal no nothing he's 27 years old so it's, it's super yeah. exciting um i'm excited for him and proud of him that's crazy congrats i see yeah. I, I see bernie and, and jordan not in their head in approval yeah, like, yeah. Hey, well, no. welcome welcome <laughs> Yo, I know. I got, I got mad questions. Uh, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to this shit. It's un, uh, uncharted territory for sure. It's fun. I it, have a lot of fun, man. I can't wait. I'm going to be blowing y'all up. Y'all have been hiding from me for all these years. Now I got y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we can get into those, some of those questions here today. I mean, um, and before we get there, I, I failed to mention and I apologize that Alessia Cara also dropped a record as well to a song for a Netflix movie. Um, so Chris, the, the legend that is Chris Smith, who is who corrected me earlier today, who has been working in four decades of the music business, um, the 90s, the 2000s, the, the 2010s, Savage. and 2020s. Um, the guy's catalog is, is crazy, or the artist that he's worked with, all the way from Philosopher Kings to Nelly Furtado, three number one hits with Nelly um, in the U.S., He's had number one hits in Latin America, and now with Alessia, these guys, he's taken over as well too. So, what's that experience been with uh, been like for you? Hey guys, 
I think really you you said something about three, four decades. I want to make it clear. I haven't been working in four decades. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like uh, some of the nineties. And we just started this uh, in the 20, 20s here. So he's making me sound like I'm like 90 years old on that. So, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm only 80. Chris Smith, is, Chris Smith is 101 years old, guys. That's, yeah. <laughs> and he's a mentor to all of you. Look, look, hey, guys, it's, it's awesome, by the way. I just had to, you know, I'm, I'm watching here. And if I was as good looking as everyone else on this call, I'd show my picture. Okay, <laughs> so there's no no doubt. Um, I think we dropped a record for a Netflix movie that she's been working on for two years, and we just kept the schedule because it's Netflix, right? They this is what everyone needs right now. Um, so not much change. We just switched, as someone had said earlier, from you know going on some of the major talk shows to uh that that online stuff and doing sessions and it's it's oddly enough i find that she's busier uh now than she was before because you it's not like you could tell people well she's busy <laughs> they right. know she's sitting at home and she's all with her friends jumping on their live and so you're finding that we have more requests because our industry was kind of set for this. You know, we're just really applying some of the tools that was sitting there, but to get our artists to get on chats and, and, and uh, online sessions, they, you know, they, I'm sure they weren't jumping up and down for it, but now, you know, it's kind of uh, understood. So we didn't really have to adjust that much for this, this release. And I'm, you know, for the most part, I think she was kind of happy to just stay home with her family and bond because sure. of what's going on in Italy. So, um, yeah, we pulled back on a few things, but not, not major. As for working for four, uh, I see you, uh, Matthew, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, uh, working for four decades and, you know, I don't know. You got to be a little more specific about that. Lots going on. You know, I've seen a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, a question that I have, like, for you specifically is, you know, because yeah. you have, you were there for a bit of the 90s, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. We're talking about, uh, um, nobody's ever been in a pandemic, but I mean, you've been able, you've had to face adversity through your entire career. We're talking about a, a black manager who was marketing artists that weren't like cookie cutter, wasn't like by the standard, uh, very different and very unique. So do you find that, is there anything, are, do, not any similarities in terms of uh, uh, marketing an artist in the pandemic, but is there anything that, you're, that you've, you can kind of tie in together of like, oh, I've kind of faced something like this similar back in the day because of resistance that you met. Like, let's be real, you're the, you know, you didn't have, help from from people to help mentor you right so is there anything that you some similarities that you find that have been able to to help you here a bit well look you know what's exciting about this when you reached out i can't i can't say you know i'm not i'm not one for major panels or getting out there ahead of the artists i think i like my job because i get to put the artists first visually so in that um Back in the day, which was, you know, uh, 95, 94, when I had my first hit with the Philosopher Kings on Columbia Records, I, you know, I was maybe as young as uh, Jordan. Jordan, you're still 21, right? <laughs> yeah, 20, 21 years old. <laughs> 21. And fuck, I wish I had a Zoom call to call a bunch of platinum managers to say, hey, what the fuck is the per diem? You know, uh, how do you do a, a budget? How, there was no one there. And, you know, I was a young black guy trying to make it work with pop artists. You know, mind you, I had my pop facing artists that were signed to major label, but being Jamaican, I always had my reggae label going. So I used the sensibility from putting out vinyl off of my reggae 
street stuff uh and i applied that to just the grind of pushing pop music and if anyone on this call uh know what a dub plate is i literally was using even dub plate strategies on nelly Furtado. i'm like a bird to get people to play the record so it's like quarantine now for me is like i started locked in a in a room in my boxer shorts and waiting for fax that was also my phone line now i have a few lines but as you i'm used to being isolated when you're an independent manager now i have a management company several management partnerships but in the day i was just a manager uh on my own isolated so this kind of brings me back to the beginning and i kind of you know i relish that you get focused you get to bond with the people you care about because they're living under the same roof but that's that's those are the similarities as for surviving i mean we can get into that a little bit more because uh again i go back to what we have here a forum where y'all are so successful and then i didn't have colleagues to reach out to because no one took me serious and i'm sure you guys experienced some of that but we have to you know you guys pushing through it and i definitely had to push through it for a long time and that's why i felt my roster was a little more diversified from rock to reggae to Latin to whatever, because I had to find the points of least resistance. And uh, it was just music and, and, and being Canadian, we love everything. So I'm like, fuck, why put me in a box? Uh, you know, I was playing hockey as much as I was like, you know, right. doing whatever else, basketball. So it was the same thing. So that's my two cents on that. I hope that explains it. Not for sure. For sure. And for you, like Byron and Ruiz, like you guys are on tour and you're launching Jesse's like debut album. So it's like, you know, two things, I don't want to say like crashing down at once, but you know, those are two major things in like Jesse's life that you kind of have to pivot quickly. Were you guys yeah. like happy with the results? Like did it exceed at what you thought the results were going to be when, like when the album got released, given the kind of the situation? Yeah, I mean, I kind of said earlier, like, if we, if this didn't all happen, we would still be on the road. And if this didn't all happen, we had like, we had like, Jimmy Fallon and Good Morning America and all these sort of traditional things you do release week to, to push everything out. But that all went away. And we were sort of just forced to like, be locked in our, in our houses in front of our computers, like, just, just working away at it. And it was, it was different, but the silver lining was we were like super available. We were we were putting the record out in real time, like like from the when it launched, we were in front of our computers, incoming emails, like like um, Corey mentioned, like we were able to turn a lot of press into into um, like phoners or Instagram takeovers. And I think we're also we're also a little bit lucky in the fact that this whole this whole landscape is new and no one had done it before. So like the Instagram live approach is new and fresh and people are excited about it. But I think maybe in a month from now, that might be a little bit played out. That might not be as exciting to people mm -hmm. anymore. So people might have to like get more creative. If this, I mean, God forbid this keeps going, but if it does, we're going to have to continue to innovate. But as for results, yeah, we were very happy. I mean, I think people are at home right now and they need, you know, I'm not gonna lie, we had a conversation about potentially pushing it. Um, and Jesse put it out to her fans and asked them what they thought. And people came back and were like, no, nah, like, drop your album. We're, this is what we need right now. This is what people want. So I think people want music. Um, people are home. People are, are, you know, they need an escape right now. I mean, it's, we're fortunate enough that we still have jobs during this, but yeah. the majority of people don't. So, yeah. you know, or we, we have the ability to, to work from home because a lot of people don't have the ability to work from home. Like, yeah. Unfortunately, they got to go out to work nine to five still. And that's a scary thing as well, too. Um, but yeah, like to, to piggyback off of what Byron said, <clears throat> we were able to hunker down and just stay in front of our computer and our phone. And so we use that to an advantage. And, and with Jesse as well, too, because none of this happens unless Jesse's on board. So like she's the one that leads at the end of the day. So we bring these options and say, listen, if we if we you know, because on Wednesday, we got a call from someone at Universal that said, if you if you pivot a couple of things, you can land in the top 20 for Billboard charts in the U.S. for albums. 
And and so we went and had the conversation with Jesse and and, and transparently it was dropping the deluxe this week, seeing if we could have a collab merch piece come out. And uh, there's a third one, I can't remember what it is. Um, sign CDs. Sign CDs, which she was already doing as well too, but then we decided to go in and sign the vinyl. I, I, I called, I, I called M's manager Paul and see if he'd be down to do a collab. Within 12 hours, we turned that around. We ended up dropping the deluxe, and Jesse was down to do all three of those things, and that really helped us uh, push our sales. And as I was telling Chris earlier, like we all of a sudden found ourselves in a week one race when, like, pro- when the pandemic hit, they were saying to us that you know we're going to do somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15 thousand albums in the U.S. Then all of a sudden we get a call, and it's like you guys can do 17 to 18 if you pivot. By the end of the week, we found out that we went into the top 20 and we landed at number 13 with just about 30,000 units sold in, in the U.S. So, okay. yeah, thank you, man. Appreciate that. And so um, I don't know if we'd be able to, like, be so connected if we were on the road. Um, who knows at the end of the day? But we yeah, felt you like, can't say. It. Yeah, it's hard to say, but if it feels successful considering the times we're in right now. Um, mm-hmm. So definitely – and then, you know, you kind of learn moving forward what, what works and what doesn't. I, I, I found interesting as well, too, that, like, the whole physical promo of it, like, how necessary is it? Sure, the Jimmy Fallon's and, and the Good Morning America's are, like, good looks, but, like, do you need to do every single thing in New York? I don't know. Yeah. You know? Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting there in that sense. Sasha, you were talking about independent, and, and there's nobody better here to talk about independent stuff than Jordan and, and Burnett. Um, you guys are on the complete independent grind with Daniel Caesar. Um, what do you – it's interesting because I think you guys are at an advantage because your the income from music isn't tied up to a royalty deal with the label, where, as we all know, if you do a label deal – chances of recoup are slim to none, slim to none. So you're, you're getting the advances. Like, let's just keep yeah. it real. Where, so now, you know, for us that are, have artists that are signed to a, a label deal, um, even if you did like a license and you did a profit split and all that stuff, like, you know, there's still money that needs to be owed, but you guys don't, you guys don't have that problem, I don't, I don't think. Um, talk to us about that and like, what's your strategy? Do you release music in this time? Do you not like what, 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 how does that work in your guys' world? Well, it's interesting because we had that conversation a couple of days ago and I and actually didn't, um, I didn't even think of it that way where we're so used to the performance of our music being directly tied to our revenue because we're independent. So, um, you know, we live and die by our streams. We live and die by our music. So it's, it's a, it's an advantage, but we also have to, we got to, we got to prepare for, we got to be careful because who knows how this is going to play out. You know, you know, streams have, they may have dipped a little bit. We're not really sure yet, but what happens in two months, three months, if we're still sort of on lockdown and we got to sort of buckle down, we got to consider that. So, you know, when we, everything that we do, when we plan, we have to, we have to think for that. We got to consider that. Okay. Well, if, if, if that's going to change the way we approach the next thing that we put out or the, the things that we already had planned to do, we got to consider that because we you know, really like we live and die by the streams and it's an, it's a huge advantage of course, but in times like this, we just got to, we got to plan for it. We got to prepare for it. I don't know, Matt, you want to like touch on that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think to that point, um, it's kind of a, a two-sided coin in that, you know, the, the benefit to living and dying by our streams is like, obviously in times like this, when touring isn't an option, you know, the fact that both Daniel and we also managed Charlotte Day Wilson, uh, the fact that both of them have really strong back catalogs, you know, that kind of provides a cushion for us to kind of just like pivot and be able to have the opportunity and the luxury of pivoting for a second and be like, you know what, let's just see how shit goes. Let's just see how things develop because to Jordan's point, it's kind of just like everything is so new and it's happening so quickly. It's kind of just like, maybe it does make the most sense to kind of release music right now, or maybe it doesn't. Like right now, everybody's turning to music, you know, as a savior, as a lifeline, because they can't do anything else. But it's like, who knows if the economy, you know, stays closed for so long, it might get to a point where people can't even necessarily afford to keep 
their streaming services. You know what I'm saying? Like it might get to a point where right. it's just like, I got to eat mm-hmm. or I got to listen to these new albums. And it's just like, if it comes to, you know, uh, um, a choice where it's either my livelihood or my ability to listen to new music, it's like, I'm obviously going to choose my livelihood. So I just think it's really, really new. Um, it's really fresh. We don't really know what's going to happen, how long we're going to be in this state. And I think for that reason, I'm happy that we're independent in that regard because we're not tied to, you know, a release schedule or having to put up music or having to do certain things. We can kind of just be like, all right, Charlotte, you're still finishing up your music. Daniel, you're working on our music slow. You guys just keep doing that. Luckily, you can do that from home. And let's just like write it out and give it a second to see where things kind of go and develop from here. I don't know if you're, if you can share, but, um, or were you guys planning on putting out any uh, an album with Charlotte um, in this time frame? Or originally, yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, we, we we didn't necessarily have a hard date, but sure, definitely this summer for sure. So now again, because everything has changed, kind of like pivoting and being like, okay, what is what makes the most sense moving forward? Um, still releasing something, the album, something smaller, like, I don't know. And again, like I said, it's still new and it's still fresh. So mm-hmm. kind of taking it day by day and also looking at guys like yourself who have released and done it and are doing it right now to kind of be like, how have you guys found it uh, to kind of help us mm-hmm. turn, you know, turn the key into, into what we should do moving forward. I, say, I, I say, think, yeah, that, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Byron mentioned something about, you know, everyone is doing the live thing right now and like, how will fans feel about it? in three weeks to a month, you know, is there going to be like a fatigue where fans are like, okay, every day I'm getting the same thing. And I think the good thing is it's going to force us to get creative because there's only so many times you can just like go on live and perform a song. You know what I mean? So we'll have to get creative. Like, how are we going to do things to keep people engaged? But um, I think for us, we were actually, we sort of lucked out where we hadn't started the rollout for Charlotte yet. So we could sort of sit back for a second and see what, you know, you like Tyler and like Chris and you, what you guys, what are you guys doing? And like have an advantage to, to look at the whole situation and be like, okay, what might work? We see what's worked with you guys. And it's like, okay, we can, maybe we can incorporate that into what we do. You know what I mean? We didn't want to, um, we didn't want to um, sort of jump into it in the sense that like, oh, it, we don't have to worry about it, but we took a second to look at it. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pivot at that point, I guess. Yeah, and, and again, sense, to, yeah. to 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 Chris's point, um, luckily I'm, I'm I'm happy that we have this kind of a community now as managers to be able to lean on our peers to be like, yo, straight up, I, I can call any one of you guys and be like, like, what's really going on? Like, how have you guys found it? Would you guys suggest dropping now versus not dropping now? Like, luckily we have this kind of community because it really helps yeah. all of us and makes us all look better as Canadian managers, managing Canadian artists. So you know, I also find you have can, you can you can call someone or you can message someone to get on a phone and get get on a call within the next couple hours rather than having to have your assistant message their assistant to schedule a meeting for next Thursday and, and sit in traffic for an hour and edit. yeah you know I mean? so like it's it's actually it's actually I find I can get like seven eight meetings or phone calls in a day and that takes up like two hours three hours of time whereas before that wouldn't even be possible that would take an entire day and I'd be exhausted come home and see yeah. like, and have to go to sleep immediately. <laughs> or you'd have to figure out the schedule and like, okay, well, you can meet at this time yeah. or like a week later or something, but now everybody's just... If anyone tells me when I ask to talk to, let, talk, talk, talk to them, like, I, like to schedule something for five days from now, like that's just it's disrespectful because everyone's... Uh, kind of if, if they're not... If <laughs> no reason not, why someone can't talk to you within 24 hours always. If somebody's it's not true. picking up the phone, you're just like, oh, they're not by their phone. I'll call back in an hour. Cause yeah. you know they're home. I still yeah, the calls I, and like, I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to stop paying my assistant cause he's like, I, I just don't want to do that yet. Yeah. But, uh, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, I still, I still like schedule calls and stuff. Just so my days like or, organize and, but, uh, but, but, but yeah, like nothing usually beyond like 24 to 48 hours, like, unless someone has like kids or some crazy reason, like it doesn't make sense. To, yeah. Christina, it's actually great communications quicker christina yeah. how, how, what about for yourself you you come from a unique position where you manage uh i mean you've been you manage tribe called red uh havaya and jeremy and all have interesting backgrounds um havaya specifically you know she she won the polaris prize in canada which was a prestigious award so congratulations on that and you come from the unique perspective where you are still 
uh, wanting to break Havaya in America. Is there a certain strategy that you are taking considering what we're going through right now or does anything change? I mean, it's an interesting time because the record's been out for just about a year. So we've been talking about what we're gonna do next and what new music is gonna look like for, for months now. So it's actually nice to have a minute to breathe and to rest and to try to figure out what that is, like the, the clarity that comes with not having to figure out what that is when you're in the middle of touring and traveling. And I think like trying to find the positivity in this, we actually are in a good position to, to just build, like to write and to build assets and to fully figure it out before, before we make a move and have time to figure out what that next move is gonna be. Um, we haven't fully figured out what that next move is going to be. Um, I mean, yeah, it, out I, of Canada is obviously the the goal. Um, we've been talking to some labels, trying to figure out if that's the move. Um, just having discussions at this point, just trying to find a, a team. Do you do do you start to maybe reconsider? knowing that, well, okay, there is an advance that could come with a record label, or if you build it, continue to build it out the way that Bernie and, and, and Jordan um, do it. Uh, I say Bernie, but Matthew, but, and Jordan, but okay. <laughs> um, do you reconsider doing it that way, knowing that there is a revenue stream coming in every single month, or do you look towards getting a potential advance with a, a bigger label and having more partners? I mean, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I don't know what the what exactly the answer is I because of where Hawaii is at right now I feel like more partners is probably the move to have more people on the ground outside of Canada that can help push this but I would like truly love to hear love to hear your thoughts um I mean revenue wise I've uh, the plan for Hawaii since day one was to try to build revenue outside of touring because that can get exhausting um sure. so we've put a lot of work into sync and into writing for sync and that's been and that's been really helpful so we've had the luxury of of having other things come in uh, while we figure it out and not being in a position where you're just like going for that advance because you have to or or yeah. not like we're doing okay like as long as as we continue to manage the cash flow well and be smart about it, like I don't feel like there's any rush to pursue anything for that purpose, just to sort of pay the bills. So I guess we're fortunate for that. Um, I don't know. I mean, my gut tells me that we need partners, but I would love to hear if anyone has any thoughts otherwise. I mean, it's tricky right now with the border. I mean, at this very moment like i wouldn't suggest you know partnering personally until you can actually like travel and meet people and be around people and see how people work but you are in a unique position where like the industry right now is like if you can't achieve something from the comfort of your own home then you need to kind of like that's the strategy is like what can i achieve with what i have you know what i mean you, there's, there's there's not really much else you can do at the moment Laurie, do you, are you finding that you guys are getting success right now too because um, you have a top 40 record in Canadian radio, right? If I'm not mistaken with Ralph? Yeah, uh, um, yeah. It, I, I think it just came off, but yeah, we had a, a top 20, yeah. Oh, you had a top 20. So did, do you find that that's, and, it, and is Ralph uh, on a label or is it independent? No, uh, we did it fully independent. Oh, wow. Okay, amazing. Have you, what, what do you, congrats. how do you see it from your perspective? And congratulations, by the way, that's, it's no small feat. Like, it's, yeah. it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. Um, it's hard to say, you know, like, I, I, I think that I look at everything that Jordan and Matt did and it's incredible, but sometimes it's a little bit of an, an anomaly. Like, if you don't have that immediate momentum going up right away, like, sometimes you do need a partner to kind of come in and and help you get to that next level and and if you if you don't need it then like that's incredible but 
and and with Ralph, you know, like it's 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 interesting. Like we've had a lot of success in Canada. Um, you know, obviously the top twenty was incredible. She just got she was nominated for her first Juno this year, um, and that's been really great to do independently. But it's it's also really tough, you know, as an independent manager on my own. You know, like it, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, but I guess when you do kind of like crack something, it, it is quite rewarding, but I guess like with risk comes reward because the, the cash flow gets super tricky and you're paying for everything. And, 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 you know, like it, it even though there's revenue coming in, it, you still have to continue investing to, to make sure that, you know, her fan base continues to grow. I think, I think people look at Jordan and Bernie and they're like, Oh yeah, well, anybody can do that. Everybody should go independent, but I don't think they realize like, this is a full team around uh, Danny. And I saw yeah. the Rap Radar interview with, it's like Dan, Daniel himself says like, Daniel sees it's not just me. Daniel is Jordan, Daniel is Matt. Daniel's like Kayvon and Sean, like you guys have a whole system. Even you were telling yeah. me like you have quarterly meetings or like monthly meetings, like to, to, on projections and stuff. It's treated like a yeah. business. Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. like Lori, to your point, um, it, it is, it, it is, it comes with its own challenges, but it is really rewarding. But, you know, a lot of people ask me and ask Matt, are you guys anti-label? And it has nothing to do with, you know, being anti or for a label. It's just about doing good business for us. And we were fortunate enough that we found ourselves in a position where we had enough relationships. We had great mentors and people like Ruiz and, and Chris and, you know, Tyler and people in this chat that we could build a relationship with and lean on. And we were able to get certain resources and we had access. So we didn't have to do certain types of, you know, deals to get that access. But, you know, not everybody can get that opportunity. So it's, you know, being realistic. I think for us, it's more about doing good business. And there's, there's pros and cons with it. You know, like in these times, like we talked about, you got to be really good with, with our finances. And, and you know, we got to plan for the next six months, just like anybody. But, you know, it's a bit, it's a different type of planning, I guess, when it's, it's so direct. But like, I agree with you, Lori. It's, it's just but, expensive yeah. and everybody looks at all the streams and the money coming in and all of the money that comes in gets reinvested into the project. So exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Be prepared to make that financial risk if you want to stay. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about having a label partner is that like, you're not paying for the recording. You're not paying for all the marketing budget. You can kind of find alternative ways to make income while they're focusing on making the record. Yeah. I think uh, to, to also add to that, um, and I'm happy that, that we're talking about this because I feel like a lot of people kind of lack clarity with respect to like just the word independent as a whole because again that word in itself is so all-encompassing you know independence can mean okay you're delivering through TuneCore and it's like it's literally just your immediate team it could also mean you know I have a license deal with the independent uh, label it also means I could have a distro or enhanced distro there's so many different um yeah degrees of being independent and i think obviously when it comes to us when it comes to daniel we built it with you know obviously going through tune core and it just being five or six of us doing everything from like having to go to the bank and like wire money you know to, to go to radio to routing the tours by ourselves to funding the, the you know the, the 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 tours ourselves to like road managing to md to whatever we had to do but at the same time it's like that doesn't make it any better or worse than if you have to lean on a partner because you don't necessarily have that immediate team around you. So that's definitely something that I wanted to, to speak about on the panel, just to provide some clarity that, you know, at least in my perspective, when it comes to independence, you know, it's kind of just all about the artist, all about the artist, all about the team and the vision. And if you can achieve that vision with just your immediate team, then by all means, like go nuts, like, you know, all the power to you, but necessarily if you can't do it, there's nothing wrong with having to lean on the right partner as long as the business makes sense. So to Jordan's point, you know, we're definitely advocates of doing good business. And me personally, I always trust that everybody, you know, everybody always asks me, should I sign a deal? Should I do this? Should I go independent like you guys? And I said, listen, man, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. We love it. We enjoy it because we love having our hands in it in every single facet of the business. One and two, we like the gratifying feeling of looking back at an idea, at an album, at a rollout, at a cycle, at a tour, at a show, at an event, and knowing we put that entire thing together. At the same time, not everybody has the team that we do. So what I tell people all the time, I'm just like, yo, listen, just do good business strive to come to the table as a partner and strive to get your business to the point where you can come to any deal, whether it's with a major or an indie as a partner, because that's when you have the most leverage. And if not, I mean, if you could afford to wait till you get to that point, then by all means, but 
you know, to yeah. this, this is all just the strength of the Jordan point that we're not anti-label. We're just pro good business by whatever that means for you and your artists. You know? and, and, and don't get it twisted. Like nobody has, nobody's like your team. Cause you guys, the thing, you guys are also producers. That's like, that's what people have to understand. Like Jordan and Matthew yeah. produce Daniel Caesar's records and they do management and, and Matthew Burnett is a musical director for Jesse Reyes. Like, before these guys even started managing Daniel Caesar, they had a record debut number one on the Billboard Hot 100, and it was the 16th song ever to do that out of 35 with Eminem, I'm Not Afraid. Those, that's two Canadians when they were like 14 and 13. Like, <laughs> age just keeps getting younger. It keeps I getting younger. I was, was, was nine when I started. But, you know, but Rui's... Our but legends, I think, but but i think but i think it's also like just really quickly just to make it clear like that's how it started it started that there's the nucleus and right. it was a really small team but we've expanded to the point where we you know we have you know we can there's no limitations to what we can do but a lot of it is contractors and you're hiring people to do certain oh. things obviously you know just like any artist who is signed to any label deal you know, there's there's nothing that Charlotte or Daniel don't have compared to any other artist. You, but we have to go out and source those things as a label, really. Well, you, you, know you I mean? reinvest the money into the company and you make the money yeah. work for you guys. Like you, you yeah. treat it. What I, I think all of us over here, what we have all in common is that we don't treat we don't have people around us to help gain the money. What we do is and we don't use people as a commodity. We use money as the commodity to grow our people and our businesses. And I think that's super important. And, uh, and I want to pivot real, well, not even pivot, but like go to Corey as well too, because Cor not only did you guys have a record debut at number one on the Hot 100, but Corey Lewin also had a record with Murder Beats debut number one. And I think it was the 31st, the 30th or the 31st record out of 35 to 30. do that, the 30th. Yeah. And it was nice for what with Drake. But the craziest thing about it is, it's not just Murder Beats who like who had that, but you also have a uh, production credit on that song, which is insane. Um, and if, I don't know if you want to get into that, but that's actually kind of cool. Please, like, please get into that. that. <laughs> yeah, we want, we want to know. Uh, if someone, someone's mic's on a ride. Um, Rap Direct actually just tagged me today's, like two minutes ago. Today's uh, two years since Nice Roll came out. It's crazy. Time flies. Already? Already? Yeah, I know, I know. It's it 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 doesn't feel like it because a time flies. We're all living crazy lives, but uh, b just because um, that song was the single before the album came out. So the album came out like six months later. Scorpion came out twenty nineteen, I think. That was like now mid twenty eighteen. But yeah, um, I'll speak about it because Murda is a uh, is a very loyal and great human being and shouts me out and gives me credit in every interview for that. But yeah, man, uh, I just accompanied Murda to uh, some sessions at the boys crib while he was before he before he moved into this house and um, was working on on some music and playing 2k and chopping it up for a few days. And uh, Drake had this idea to make a New Orleans bounce record and uh, played us, played us some uh, black and mild um, ex examples, um, and we were thinking of a female to sample. Uh, and then Murda, they were bouncing some ideas back and forth, like Alicia Keys, this and that. You had a, and Murda's like, Corey, you're old as fuck. Wow, wow, wow! You come up with an idea, and me and Drake are actually this, this, the same age. But um, I, I, I said. I said, look, Lauren Hill, and Drake's like, ooh, which song? And I said, X Factor, which part? And then I sang The Bridge, and Murder being born in 94, three years before it came out, hadn't heard the song, but quick, quickly downloaded it on his laptop. Fucked with the idea, Drake, Drake loved the idea. And yeah, the Murder, from Murder then, Murder then chopping up, up the sample, making the beat, Drake making the first verse and the hook, the whole song. From, from, from me saying the idea of Lauren Hill's X Factor to the song pretty much being done, it was like an hour and a half. And, and, yeah, crazy. That's you guys crazy. and then also before, 
we were going back and forth, me and Murda, not everyone here being either from Canada or involved with Canadians knows how, especially Tyler working with OVO, you know, knows um, how tight knit that group is. And we were kind of unsure if I should put my name on it. Obviously this, the sample took a big portion of, of the song. And I, th I think we initially sent in as like additional production for me. And uh, I'd actually called Mr. Morgan the next day um, and told him, you know what, actually, I think I should take my name off of it. I, I, I just thought that it would seem like weird to people that why is my name on it or whatever. And then he said, you know what, actually, I talked, I, I called Drake when I saw it. I thought it was weird that you as Murder's manager's name was on it. And Drake said, no, Corey came up with the idea of the Lauren Hill sample. He's a producer. So that's amazing. So that's boy for being a real one. Yeah. That's amazing. So do you? Do you guys find that, um, well, now that we're all in quarantine, how does it operate for, for Murder now? Because I would imagine that he likes being in the studio. I mean, I know he likes being in the studio with the artist. Yeah, especially because, like, the, the majority of Murder's placements, not the majority, actually. Um, we were talking about this recently. Uh, but many of Murder's, like, that, that moment, nice for what, and Murder coming up with the Migos, and he, does, he, he, he sends Quavo and... The Migos beats, but but many of their many of their great songs have come up from him going out there. Murder, Murder's first two songs with Travis Scott came from him being in the studio with Travis, and Murder really likes locking in with people. Um, so we still will send out packs here and there when people ask for it, um, but we always like to get in with it. And just similar to what I was saying before with the meetings and how we're actually getting more done now, because we'd we'd like if we were going to work with Jesse, we'd find out, okay, Jesse's coming. Jesse's going to be off tour in June. So rather than sending her a pack today, April 6th, we'll work with her June 20th when she's in LA. Now, because everyone's stuck at home, uh, we were sending out packs to everybody. Hit me after, remind me, I'll send you a pack for Jesse tonight. I would Jordan, Matthew would love to get some shit with Daniel and maybe Murder can send you some ideas to collab. Chris, we got some shit for Alexia, Sasha. I'm pretty sure Murder's already sending to party and Murder cook up every single day. And like, yeah, we I probably sent out more packs and Murder sent out more packs in the last three weeks. Jesse we just Je Jesse, Jesse just texted us and says to get that pack. Get that pack you. from Murder. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've been sending out more and we've actually been, um, uh, I actually just met Milan last week because uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago in quarantine murder, we've been waiting to get in with Russ, but because no one's seeing people because social distancing, we sent Russ a pack and now, uh, I don't know if it's too soon to speak on this, but yeah, we, we have a song on his next project coming out. And uh, there's, yeah, like some, one of my producers too, who's a newer producer, Murder Gang, managed by me and it's been, more difficult to get him into sessions with some of these elite artists because he's not yet uh, a level producer. Uh, uh, an a level artist has taken a huge liking to his beats and now he's working with him a lot and got it and now has a next single with an other artist who he's working with through this quarantine time. So he's actually starting his run as a lit producer in the last two or three weeks from because it doesn't matter what, what your name is. People are just, I guess, opening up packs more. And we've been, Murda's been, Murda, Murda likes to go cook up in the big studios too, or, or likes to be inspired, cook up with other producers. But now he's just found a, bought a bunch of lights in his house he's in and just found a, a good creative space there. And he's, he's cooking up every day, every, every, few hours i'll cook up for a couple hours go play video games for a bit and which we now party and murder did a charity this morning with phase clan playing games so yeah murder and party did yeah phase clan did a charity this is the second or third third one murder's done in quarantine he plays call of duty for charity oh crazy all right let's go murder and party and myself and tyler are actually partners who uh video game gaming network that um, because of this time, we're actually launching early. We're going to be launching next week. That's, really more about That's actually good to lead into my other question. It was like, well, how are you guys finding, like, what are some revenue streams that you guys are looking at at this time, considering, you know, touring is done for all of us at the time being? Gaming. 
Jamie, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, the anybody same else? Guy. Yeah, no fun. Anyone uh, else? Think for us. What'd you say? Mostly sync. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sync's been huge for us too. Shout out shout out to Tyler for sending asking along a great opportunity today. Yeah. I can't tell if Tyler's frozen or if he's just looking at us really seriously right now. <laughs> <laughs> just like at us. Yeah, he's frozen. He is frozen. He's definitely, he's deep definitely in thought, frozen. Man. Yeah, Tyler's deep in thought right now. <laughs> or he's just looking at Glory like you shouldn't be talking about this gaming thing. We we're gonna announce next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a partner too, so I made the executive decision. You made the executive. There he is. I'm back. Sorry about that. There he is. Tyler, I just spilled a lot of secrets. <laughs> What'd you say? No, I just, I just uh, said that we have a gaming company launching next week. Yeah, I think you asked what are what are some ways that clients are still making money throughout this time. Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. yeah. That's for anybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's, um, you know, it's, that's, that's one of the projects Corey and I are working on right now with Murda and Party, and it's just figuring out their interests and how we can either build a business around that or how we can find the right partners, you know, whether they want to invest in, in a gaming company, whether they want to use this time to develop a new product, to learn about the stock market, whatever it is, uh, now more than ever, we should be asking our clients, you know, in addition to music, which we're obviously going to be focusing on, what, uh, what other industries and businesses interest you that we can start working towards? You know, if you do always want to, have you always want to start a label that we can really actually start laying out the blueprint for, uh, you know, now more than ever is the time for us to, to start putting those pieces together. Yeah. Focus on those things that on any other day you wouldn't have time to focus on. Yeah, exactly. True. Melissa, we've also, we've also on Jesse's phone, we've also, also been able to find some like some brand opportunities that you know have paychecks involved just with this craze that live streaming is is bringing on Instagram and on YouTube and stuff which I don't know how long it'll last but just right now right now at this very moment there's brands cutting checks for artists to jump on their Instagram channels and perform songs so that's that's on that's something that we've been doing with this quarantine radio thing is there have been some brands that have expressed um that have expressed interest and so it's been interesting trying to navigate like you know obviously it's a lot it's a lot of views but not the content isn't necessarily you know um adored by all so trying to figure out trying to figure that out but there's been a lot of brands that have wanted to play ball with him and that's been um that's been huge too you also um, so for people to know sasha you also come from the promoting world as well too you do score more in texas but you also did a joint venture with live nation um can you talk to us a little bit about how you guys are looking at touring for the next little bit, considering, you know, what company you did a joint venture with? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Canadians run my life. I'm not Canadian, but on both <laughs> sides of my, on both sides of my career, I report to almost exclusively Canadians at Live Nation. <laughs> I report to another Canadian too. Um, you know, I, uh, it's a really good question. I think, you know, we were talking about this earlier today, you know, for us, we had a lot of shows. So we do festivals. Um, we had festivals that were slated to play in May, including Dreamville that was going to be April 4th. Um, we ended up moving that to August 29th. And now the rest of our festivals are playing in September. You know, all I can tell you really is that, you know, we have a full-time staff where this is what we do. We produce events. Everybody is, expecting to be able to produce these shows august september october november um we're just kind of playing the hand that we're dealt you know if you would have told me three weeks ago you know dreamville is not going to play because of covid i would have said like oh, all right you know so i mean things are changing so much in real time um you know some of it, it there are just so many factors here right there I, and i think first and foremost is everybody's health and safety and you know we're going to defer to local and city officials whether it be you know councilman mayor whatever it may be um but it's it's going to be really interesting it's interesting times i mean i think you know going back to you know those of you who are making money on the music side and you know on the independent side and matthew and jordan you know um just like can't say enough incredible shit about what you guys have done but i think 
you know, if you would have said to someone five years ago, let me tell you what, the people in the recorded music space, they're good, but everyone in live, they're fucked. You would have like laughed, right? Like, <laughs> like it's yeah, like legit. Wow. It, it's crazy. So like now it's on the flip side where like everybody you know that has music. If you actually own your music, I think that you know we're now getting to a place where artists and managers are understanding like music is an annuity. Like this is a cash flowing asset. You know these are things that you can have forever. You're right. Shows, right. festivals, these are transactional. You know, and and uh, music is so different. And um, now you can have exits on catalogs. You can sell catalogs. Holy yeah. Shit. You know, so I think that music in and of itself, not to go from live back to recorded music. Listen, I bought Live Nation stock. I'll tell you that. I'm not scared. I know it'll be back. It's just a matter of when. Yeah, People want to have fun. People want to celebrate together. It's uh, unforeseen circumstances. I'll say this. I'm very fortunate to work at a company where despite the fact that the stock went from where it went to, he has not fired a single person. Everyone has their job. We still have full benefits. So like, I'm just super grateful to Live Nation and the fact that like, listen, as long as they're not scared, we're not scared. We're gonna keep on going. Um, but thanks for asking the question. I think, I think Live Nation is just too big to fail. That's me personally. Man, they got some, you know, they got some really special people there. And like, I know that sometimes, you know, they're like the big behemoth and corporate. So it's easy to kind of look away, but I think, what we I love think, it. it's Canada, man. We love it. Yeah, no, 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 no. I know that, and I know that you know shit. I mean, we were lucky enough to be the promoters of of Jesse's tour, so yeah. you know, I um, yeah. I like we love. I don't know. I think what people are going to start to understand, and from the outside looking in, is that like this company is special, and that their leadership is special. And in a time where a lot of people are losing their jobs, and you have leadership who's letting people go, and that's not. To, Listen, people are in whatever circumstance that they are. I'm not one to judge. But the fact that here's this person who's saying, not, nah, I'm riding with my people. They're who got us here. We're going to get through it. And we're going to be stronger at the end of the day. Like, I feel super fortunate for that. Uh, well, you, I mean, you're fortunate just by the people you work with. Like you said, you, like, Tory Lanez, uh, you know, we always knew he was like a, a double, triple threat. He can perform. He can sing. He can rap. Uh, he can write. He's an incredible writer. But now he's like, he's also like a host. He is like yeah. becoming <laughs> personality. He's, he's a personality. Yeah. Yeah. But like, he's like <laughs> he's he's like Joe Budden or like N O R E, but he's still active making music. Like he does quarantine radio tomorrow on Friday, he drops a single. Yeah. Like Four million streams. Yeah. Uh I mean the dude's incredible. Like and I've been saying that for the longest and I know like, you know, um Corey, you know, you you know um um, Byron, you know, Ruiz, you know him. I know Tyler, you know him too. So y'all have spent time with him. I mean, he really is unlike anybody, you know, I've been super fortunate in that, you know, I've really been, you know, focused on Jess Tory, you know, on the management side for so many years. And that's because I believe that he's a once in a generation type guy. And, um, for many reasons. And I think quarantine radio is like reminding others like, yo, this dude is unfucking real. And, um, yeah, I felt that way. So welcome, welcome, you know, welcome to the club. And, you know, Ruiz, we were laughing. We worked on a video together and Ruiz and there was some other managers, Byron included. They were like, dude, I don't know how the fuck you do it. Like this shit, like, <laughs> like I don't know how you do it. But then like when something like Quarantine Radio happens, like, and you guys can see it, it's like, yo, I think, and every manager here understands, like we, we're taking, you know, with the good, with the bad. Some managers call me and they're like, yo, I can't get, my artist to make a song i'm like i can't get like i can't stop the features like i'm just trying to control <laughs> trying to control traffic so you know and on the flip side obviously you know like there are other ways i feel like they're all pros and cons i always feel like when it comes to artist managers all of us as individuals we all have different attributes we have the same amount of points they're just distributed differently um so yeah i don't know man chris oh no, that's great chris i, I I think there's probably nobody better here than you that could, can identify what a superstar looks like because you've worked with plenty. How do you identify that? You know, for me, it's really about just having that gut feeling when someone walks into your office. And that's really it. There's no real formula. You sort of you just fall in love and you commit and you go for it. Um, that's it. It's really, and whenever, 
you know, I've looked at artists because of their numbers and people send me uh, sales or YouTube or Twitter, whatever stats, you know, it's never quite worked out for me. But for me, it's always been just visualizing that person uh, being where they say they want to go and their vision for their career. You know, I take on artists that, that really understand who they are. It's not really for me to craft anything or anyone. So my job is really to help an artist execute, you know, their dreams or their vision. So I think in a long discussion or hanging out, that's kind of how I come to um, my decision. And I need people around me that work harder than I do. It's nothing like when you got to bug an artist to do what they need to do for their career. I don't think it ever is, you know, it hasn't worked for me in 20 years. And the ones that can stay ahead of me and I try to stay ahead of them. And it's sort of like, we get really competitive on delivering and, not wanting to fail them and they want to make you proud of the, the, the how they connect to their own business it works so i think that that's the answer there's no one formula it's just the gut if you think you could be you know great partners with an artist and if you can sit on a flight with them from you know for 18 hours and still like them because of their ideas <laughs> you know right. so if, if i can't sit with you for that long i'm not in business with you kind of thing so there's a bunch of factors for me it's weird but you know that's how i look at it and uh, i just help people do what they they want to do and i have to they have to sell me on their vision and then i buy into it and go for it and throw it out Melissa, you've been working with um, Quake for some time as well, too, who's like, just you guys are an amazing pen. He's like, I've been watching his lives as well, too, and you guys have been doing some some creative and unique things as well, where he's jumping into people's lives, just basically rapping, um, and he's getting a lot of good response. How did you guys, how did you guys come about doing that, and um, what was the thought process there? I think what even just to kind of bring it back to what Christina was talking about or, you know, asking before, um, one of the things that Quake and I have just kind of found in the past, like two weeks, is just like access. Like it's just been super easy to, I guess, get in front of a lot of people within the industry. Um, and so for us, it's more kind of like a conquer and divide sort of situation. Um, for him as the artist, like being able to, you know, get on and rap and do kind of the five fingers um, was a huge kind of like moment for him in that sense. Um, and that's one thing that we were kind of looking at is like, what are some of the different kind of outlets, especially on like Instagram, because that's where all of his traffic is and where all these, you know, Instagram live sessions are happening. Um, where can he kind of get in and access those different um, live sessions. Um, and then knowing that like we're all quarantined, we're, you know, we're in our house. So what type of content can we start creating right now? Um, given kind of the parameters of our situation and knowing that we can't really go out and shoot music videos or even shoot a lot of content um, outside. And I think Tyler might've mentioned just looking at other kind of business opportunities. And one thing that Quake really does like enjoy and wanted to get more into was like interviewing um, other artists and other like, you know, people in the industry. And so, you know, we just kind of started hitting up our network and kind of seeing who we could kind of lock down. And that's how we kind of created the tap in where, you know, I think pretty much like last week he's done like three interviews and I think two more this week as well. Um, with a lot of people within the industry that are home right now. Cause I mean, as we all talked about, everyone has time. Um, mm -hmm. so that's, you know, I think that's kind of what we're playing off as is knowing that, you know, everyone has time, people are at home and really looking at our networks that we haven't say like, you know, activated as much as we, we can and, and creating opportunities, um, like the tap in like the panel um, through human resources and like this um, that we can really, you know, bring people together and just kind of leverage 
those different um, access yeah. points. Yeah, shout out to Troy Carter and Susie and Jay Irvin because they're the ones that inspired me for, well, for us to do this year. They've been doing an amazing job with that. So it's pretty special. Um, and just being you. able to, Corey, sorry, just one more thing, Ruiz. Um, yeah, we couldn't hear and you. And this is just you're muted, by more. the way. So, Corey, you're muted. I was going to say shout out to Troy Carter and Ryan Price mm -hmm. also for deciding last minute to do a panel the exact same time as ours. <laughs> <laughs> Proceed. Um, <laughs> Because, Christina, I feel like you and I are kind of this, you know, the similar level with the artists that we manage um, and looking at, you know, label situations or, you know, building something independent. Um, and even though we can't kind of, you know, travel across the border right now, um, it's still for me like setting up those meetings and knowing again that everyone is accessible. And this is probably our greatest opportunity to kind of even just start those relationships and kind of start having those conversations. So when things kind of get back to normal, we're able to travel again. It's almost like we already have our foot in the door and we've already had kind of that first conversation. Um, and then we can kind of continue building on those relationships. So I know that's been really instrumental for like myself and Quake um, is really just having those conversations right now because the access, you know, is there and I don't know if we would have, you know, had those opportunities or those opportunities may have not happened as quick as they did given the situation. Cool. Um, but on that note too, I know that we're, you know, probably almost like an hour and 15 in. Um, do you want to maybe just kind of do one more kind of wrap up and then take a look at some of the questions that are in there? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, wrap up how, what do we? <laughs> or maybe just, is there any like other, you know, does anyone have any other like questions? Like, <laughs> I guess yeah. as a group or like one more kind of question you want to yeah, ask I've the been, panelists? I've been, asking, I've been asking questions here, but I'm, I'm sure if people got questions, please feel free. Um, Cause I don't really have many more questions. Well, I do. I can ask questions for days. I can tell a story about how Corey Litwin uh, went and got <laughs> DMX after 24 hours by looking at my sweater because I was wearing a, a DMX hoodie. And he's like, Murder Beats is doing Coachella, a DJ set. It'd be sick if I got DMX for a show. And I was like, you can do it, Corey. If there's anybody that could do it, you could do it. And I see him yeah. huddle his team. He grabs them. They go put their hands in the middle, break, disappear from this event that we were at. And then 12 hours later, called me. He's like, I got DMX. <laughs> this guy's an incredible hustler. But um, I just wanted to mention that. It's because it's, it's cause Jesse said, or Jesse, you said, if anyone can do it, Corey, it's you. So I felt it was like a dare and I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that answered the question. Call. I have a question for Matthew and Jordan. How does, how does, a, how does one work with y'all to get one with our local hometown hero, Daniel Caesar. <laughs> Send the heat, can, you guys, can, you guys, can you guys stop ball hogging Daniel and let, and let Murder get one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, listen, like one thing, one thing people have to realize, and again, obviously nobody would know this, but like the way Daniel writes, it all comes from him, bro. There's no sending beats. There's no like collabs over internet. It's like he literally writes everything himself on piano, on guitar, or honestly now he's in his producer bag. So he'd be like making his own beats, bro. And like he'll send it to us and we'll just be like, all right, well, we'll just try and enhance this. But yo, he's getting nice. So you kind of yeah. got to like, it's one of those things where it has to happen or like organically. You got to get in the room with it. Yeah, if they find themselves in the same room, then it's like the magic will happen. But like, he's that kind of artist. It all comes from him. We just literally are there to just offer support and like enhance whatever he's already bringing to the table. I think we were actually supposed to have like the first session ever together like a month or two ago when y'all were here. He was at he was at Hit Doctor or something. Hmm. Um, but it never ended up happening. But yeah, I mean, how, how how often is murder in Toronto? <laughs> is he even here that often? Not often. And if he does, yeah. you probably don't hear of it. Until you see him right. at the club that night DJing, and then he's out there. <laughs> I try to come back a lot, but yeah. yeah, he he he. Uh, a he's not from Toronto, also he's from Fort Erie, Niagara. But uh, oh, yeah, okay. he's, yeah, not awesome. Um, I had I had a quick question. How do you guys feel? And again, this is open to kind of anybody. How do you guys feel the live industry is going to bounce back? Like once we are allowed to go outdoors again, and the industry opens back up. 
what do you think that looks like? Do you think people are going to be in a rush to go and attend concerts? Do you think artists are going to, um, you know, rush to kind of get back out on tour <laughs> to try and make back, you know, I, I, lost I, I, bread? Like, I'm what do you think for, that looks like? I think I'm going to be for Sasha to answer that. Yo, run it. Um, That's what I was looking for. <laughs> run it. <laughs> Waiting for you, Sasha. Lucky. Run it. We got run it. Run it. Run it. I mean, <laughs> kid, I'm going to be ready. Uh, nah, I'm just, I mean. You have to be ready. Yeah, I think you ain't got no choice, bro. <laughs> what? I said you ain't got no choice, bro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, there's a lot of different factors at play when you talk about the live business coming back, right? One, you got about the economy. Are people going to have the money to spend discretionary money on tickets? I think the answer we know to be yes, because people have been spending money on discretionary, you know, things for a long time, always entertainment, even in peaks and valleys. Then there's the concern as far as do pe people feel safe being in large gatherings of people. I can only speak on like behalf of us and our events. Like I, uh, for the most part, we represent like the youth and the youth are, they're going to be ready to get back after it. The second that their city and local authorities say that it's okay and safe. So listen, I really hope that, you know, that we can get back after it. Like I said, Dreamville's August 29th. I hope that it's beautiful. I hope that all of your smiling faces are there. And then I hope that from August on going good, um you know but who you knows us, bro. what up you didn't book us <laughs> where's the oh, offer man. yo y'all yo man y'all are <laughs> cutting out y'all are cutting out as well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was not my intention for the record yeah. no 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 i mean i think no, it's a good question. It, was, it was cole's decision it wasn't sasha's <laughs> yo now you're really gonna try to put me in harm's way no <laughs> man listen but i think is. I, I, you know, it's really, it's really, you know, like I said, I, I'm just, I'm ready. I'm, you know, like everybody, I think we're all ready for things to get back in the interim. We're going to continue to check every single day to monitor how things are looking, but we are prepared to play everybody at my company at our company. Overall, we are prepared to play and it's our intentions on getting back after it this year. Um, with that being said, I like wasting time. Yeah. So I just want to take some of these Q and A questions. Um, there's about sixty of them, but we'll just do a couple. Um, so just to bring things kind of back when you guys got started, um, one of the questions here is how can, or where is it? Sorry. What are some of the steps you guys took in the initial phases to get your artists from like local status to kind of top top tier? Like, were there any kind of define like moments and things that really kind of broke you? I think there's so much development involved that people don't see behind closed doors. You know, like I remember five years ago, Ruiz, you were playing me Jesse Reyes demos in your car, you know, and yeah. it was years after before that music come out and, and you guys did it. So it, it really takes years and years and write, you know, like you need to be writing the best music possible. You need to be writing music as good as your competitors for it to really kind of matter and make a difference. I think some, some of that pe people might not know is that, Lori, you were the first person to ever tell us to come to any record label and say, I want you to play some music for the label. Cause at the time you were working at Universal Canada and you came over with uh, Richard from the UK and and um, so that was, you know, that was the first time we ever went into a record label to just like show what was up. Um, it was it was just a meeting, but you know, I mean, um, you're absolutely right. For us, uh, we didn't go out to public with our with with the music with Jesse until we got all the pieces that we felt we needed to have before we ended up launching. And for us, that was a publicist, that was a lawyer, and that was an agent. And so we got all these things put together, and. I, I have my content agency as well too with Mad Rock Entertainment that does music videos. So I have a, I have a unique experience as well in that world because I can cover the visual component. And we we didn't go up, put up figures. I mean, we didn't even, we weren't signed to a label. We Our first two songs that we put out were independent completely. So we did the same thing as well too, um, uh, independently. And once we put out figures with the right visual and our PR person, Dana Meyerson, who's still with us to this day from Biz3, 
uh, she put she made sure that we were teed up with Fader, and then oh, well, 24 hours before that, we were with uh, teed up with um, um, Zane. with Zane Lowe. Yeah, Beats One put the record through there as a premiere. Then 24 hours later, it came through Fader with the video, and then literally 24 hours later, every, my e our emails were flooded with like every single record label you could imagine and like executive after executive. And funny enough, Darkest was the first chairman that I ever spoke to. And years later, he ends up coming over to Ireland where Jesse ended up signing. But, and, and the thing, the funny thing about it is that Jesse always, always had a vision of how this was gonna roll out, but we just didn't have all the pieces in place. So she's, credit to her, cause super patient, making sure that we had it all right before we said, okay, let's push the button and go. because. I, th I feel like once you go, when you get out there and you have pieces in play, it's, it's hard to like, you know, go backwards. Um, so you want to be as set up as possible before you start releasing music to the world. But it doesn't mean to be precious either because at a certain point you fall out of love with music, but just make sure that you have as much possible together and your content uh, together as well too. Uh, for Byron, Jesse and myself and the team internally, um, we're in a unique position because we've like shot so much content over the last six to eight months to where like maybe a year ago, if somebody asked us, yo, what are you shooting all this content for? We could say like, oh, cause we know a pandemic is coming. Like that's how much content, <laughs> that's how much content we've got. And, and fortunately it's going to be able to carry us out if we really stretch it throughout the year. So, you know, that's, that's always, that's always been something that the mindset that we've had is just like, have the assets, have the assets, and um, and gather them before you go out, because it's a marathon, not a sprint. I think with I think with every artist too, it's a series of moments. It's not just one definitive moment that that gets them there. It's 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 one thing that leads to an next, it leads to an next, it leads to an next, and you just got to be ready for all of them. Yeah. Another question here is like recent graduates of like music business programs focusing on artist management. Um, they're curious to know how you all got your start as a manager in quarantine aside, what's the best way to approach organizations, kind of labels, companies, your guys' companies um, for internship, and sorry, internships and assistant like opportunities to get their career started. Fly to LA, move to LA. For me. Can't, do, can't do that right now. How does that close, bro? <laughs> Chris, I'm, I'm actually curious to know how you got started. Hey, I'm back. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, there, there's so many different facets to this business and people are talking about, you know, great questions. And I'm sitting here taking notes on everything. I uh, My family's always in in music, it feels like with, I have a famous uncle, Bear Hammond, who's a reggae singer. And I grew up backstage, my mom, aunt, cousins are DJs. And I thought I was going to the financial business because that was the family business. And my uncle pulled me in on a tour um, of the UK. Um, and when I saw, you know, for the first time, I was a little more receptive on that level to observe what, how the audience was reacting to his music. And I felt the power of music. So I quickly, quickly then uh, gave up the Bay Street, Wall Street side of my brain to say, okay, I'll jump back in the family business. And, and then I decided to build my own roster, which was just really, uh, if you guys, you know, finding the philosopher kings and and just you know we need a two hour <laughs> uh, session to go back to the beginning. But look, you have to make sacrifices, okay? You have to be as in early early days. I was driving the van, doing the sound, the lights, everything, and it's quite rewarding when you can go from that to sold out theaters, and from there to arenas and then stadiums uh, but it's really about believing in your artists and, and you know I was uh, a young manager with uh, a young uh, son at the time and it was really hard 
you know, and you have to sacrifice everything for your artist. Remember, you know, cars getting repossessed, um, sleeping on my sister's sofa, and you're fucking, you're, you know, your band is gold or platinum, and you gotta, you know, there's five guys in a band, and you wanna help them with their bills, so you, you know, you gotta go all in. And that's kind of, I think the key to success is staying with it. And artists will get to number one, but they, they will also, you know, fall off the charts for whatever reason. And I think as management, we just have to commit to sticking it out with them. And it's not really what we do when they're number one, it's what we do when they're down and how quick we get them back up. So I think the essence of management is really about the commitment. And for me, the starting point was just jumping in. And when I got in, I lost everything. But then just believing and reading fan mail. Now y'all, you know, I wake up and I, before I look at the photo, I'm reading the comments because that's what motivates me to understand how people are connecting with my artists. So I started and, you know, I've been up and down. You hit the top, you hit a number one globally. For next month, you could be just, no one's taking your call. They take two weeks to return your phone call, right. if that, until you have another hit. So the word out there is, me to every young manager that's listening to this it's like you know be strong and believe and do what you got to do to survive and push hard for that artist if you got to work an overnight job at the grocery store or whatever you got to do you got to believe not give up and trust me everyone told me what the hell are you doing you know you went to college for this and that his band it's not working and you get you can't give up so that's sort of uh my two cents on it and this music thing when it works as everyone on this phone call can attest to it's beautiful and it's challenging but it's a great way to make a living that's it wow incredible yeah. answer <laughs> yeah. all right <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all for your attention. <laughs> I think, I think uh, if, if you want to take more questions, or we could just end yeah. it there. Or um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to go to, from there because that was perfect. But no, it was perfect. Right um, but I think there's just one more topic that we haven't touched on yet, and there are definitely um, some questions in here about it. And it's you know. I guess the advantages of being Canadian and working with Canadian artists and, you know, running a Canadian business, obviously we do have access um, to funding. Um, and right now we're seeing a lot of different types of like relief funding for the music industry. Has anyone taken advantage of the government funding at these times? Um, has your artists been like inquiring about it? Um, what are your thoughts you know, on it in that sense? Uh, I currently, I, I, I'm actually going to ask you guys, um, if any of you have tapped into the, the Canadian grants, like the OMF grant and stuff, I'm in the first year of doing a little one. So. Yeah, we do OMF. Actually, I just got an email about Factor, which is anyone who doesn't know, it's one of the main artist grants in, in uh, Canada. And, um, they said that they're going to be pretty lenient about, you know, like budgeting and, and and you know with touring and everything being pushed they're sort of like helping us out by um giving us extra time and like they're not going to pull back any money they're not going to be too stringent on, on our spends for the next little while which is amazing so they're definitely doing their part for us which is great anybody who's in that system so that's good yeah we just heard back today also that um, finally uh it took some time for murda for factor today we just got the approval notice because him of him dropping uh his new single out. Nice, yeah. Nice, congrats. Thank you. We do like all the grants. Sorry? We do all the grants. There's a lot of them out there. Can, can you name it? Can you I name a couple of Star Maker. Oh, Sorry? So yeah, yeah, can you name a couple yeah. of the grants so people can know? Um, well, there's the, there's the Arts Council grants and then there's the more like business driven and they have different mandates for the most part. Like there's, there's arts councils on the federal level, there's the Canada Council for the Arts, and then on 
the provincial level. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I mean, they have different mandates. It's, you can get recording funding and touring funding through the arts councils as well, but um, you're making more of a case for how it benefits artists and people observing art and how it, it sort of like contributes to quality of life and community and it's sort of a, I mean, it's just a, a different approach. And then you have the sort of more business focus, which are the OMF and Factor and RSF. They want marketing plans and business plans and mm -hmm. yeah, just different sort of uh, mandates. Byron, you were mentioning- We actually made, we actually made um, Daniel Caesar's first, first album, content, production, even like marketing, Factor, Star Maker, back when there was much fact. This was before we had o OMF, but we used grants to make all that, you know, yeah. like, yeah, we put in some of our own money, but a so lot of it was grants. Shout out to yeah. SoCan as well. SoCan is like, you know, Rodney over there has been super helpful to. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Rodney. And I think too, when it comes to grants, like, and if you do end up signing a deal, if you can keep Canada, keep Canada. Because yeah. Yeah. it's very important. It's very important. <laughs> yeah. Having yeah. those grants when you're signed to a major gives you so much leverage. So if you're signed yeah. to like US major and you want to go tour Asia because you have a fan base there, the grants give you leverage to be able to do it because you're no longer um, waiting on tour support from them. You can pay it through Star Maker or you can pay it through Factor. So <laughs> if you can, it is so beneficial to be able to keep Canada and to build that leverage against the whatever deal that you make outside of Canada. Yeah, very true. I also just saw, um, I got an email that Star Maker was, you know, regardless of if your tour was canceled and you hadn't applied yet, they were still taking applications for that de for that specific deadline. So regardless of a tour being canceled, they're still paying people out the fund. That's great. So that's incredible. And yeah. also um, like through SEMA, so through like our Canadian International like Music Association, um, they have a lot of, I think, webinars happening like this weekend next, just in regards to different like relief funding for artists and music entrepreneurs and how they can access that. Um, I know that, you know, SOCAN has also put out some funding and relief programs there for their members. Um, SOCAN Foundation, you have what, Unison um, has, a, like a, has a big um, relief fund in there as well, um, just to help like any artists and, you know, entrepreneurs that are in that kind of situation right now so you know definitely especially for the participants you know if that's something that you need um you know reach out to those organizations and certainly apply yeah i, I i'd add to that i think we come from a unique perspective as well too because i, I, I talk specifically to toronto but i think this could apply to canada is that you know one one thing that always kind of comes up i think for tory or or for Jesse, even Drake is like, um, you do so many different things, but it's just because we've grown up in so many different cultures around us that like it's a melting pot. So we're influenced by so much different music. And finally, like, I think the world is accepting that we're, we're not living in a genre. We're like always in genre party as well too. What am I saying? Like party as well too. He's like, we're all, we have genreless artists where, and that's where the music business is is currently in because we have so many influences. I mean, if you would have told me that um, uh, a black kid from Ajax playing the guitar was gonna be able to sell out back to back at the Budweiser stage with 20 to 30,000 people, I'd be like 10 years ago, I'd be like, you're crazy. It's not gonna happen. But now it's like, yeah, no shit. And we'd be like, well, <laughs> Yeah, because you know it's crazy. You know it's crazy. He's not even from Ajax. He's from Oshawa. <laughs> even <laughs> deeper, bro. Even, even, even deeper. <laughs> further. <laughs> even further. Or that. Or God, that. Uh, or right. that. Or that. A white, a white kid from Fort Erie, Ontario, would become the biggest rap producer. Real shit. Real shit. When I see when I and it's like, you're looking at videos of like murder beats with Migos, and he fits right in. So I mean, we coming. We're coming from such a different perspective, but I think it's like the world is starting to recognize it and. Shout out to Sasha and Tyler for recognizing some of those artists as well, too, and, and working with us. So, yeah, so I, I don't know if there's any more questions, but 
Uh, real shit, I appreciate you guys all doing this. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I hope it's been informative. And um, uh, Corey, I'll be reaching out to you for BPAC. Sasha, feature, uh, Jordan, Matthew, Greg. <laughs> Let's all talk after we get off here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Send that off. Yo, send that off yo, for group text, text, bro. Group text. Yo, hey, group much text. respect to all y'all for doing what you do. Likewise. Thank you. Likewise. And thank Marie, you, thank you for putting this together, bro. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bro. All day. Mm -hmm. Love. Appreciate guys. you guys. Love. You guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys, man. Thank you.